meniscus repair. I'm going to keep this pretty pragmatic because we've got a practical session now. So I'm going to talk about more than a little bit of the basic science because you do need to know it to know why you're doing a repair. But I'm not going to go on about the history and the histology of it all. Um, the one thing I have to mention is that it is one of the a triad of essential parts that you need all to be normal for normal knee function is critical. And so ligaments cartilage you need as well as intact menisci. Um, Prim and uh, Reg will be talking about an ACL shortly. So, Roy, why would you say for the meniscus? What does it do? Um, it's a kind of shock absorber, prevents development of arthritis down the line, and yeah. also uh, allows greater function. Okay, I like the first and second one a bit broad. Low transmission is the key thing, um, and its job is to basically transmit forces from the tibia, uh, from the femur to the tibia, and that's the thing. It does go, it does do some shock absorption. It also has this uh, purpose of joint stability, a bit like these chocks that keep an airplane wheel in place. Can you see how the anterior posterior horn of the menisci hold that in place? And we know that if you do a medial meniscectomy, particularly in an ACL tension knee, you will get increased AP laxity because you've lost those. Um, and as a result, you can get increased wear. Similarly, if you lose your lateral meniscus, you can end up some rotational instability. And I'll show you why in a second. It helps dissipate the articular contact forces by <coughs> spreading them over a wider area. It has the meniscus have a role in lubrication, nutrition, proprioception. The reason I'm showing you this is this is actually really quite important as to why we go ahead and why we do repairs if we possibly can. The, everything on the medial side is bigger. The femur and the tibial plateau are bigger than the lateral side. But on the medial side, the tibial plateau is concave. So you've got um, your femur sitting in there. So it's actually a pretty robust um, construct anyway. Whereas on the lateral side, you've got a convex lateral plateau. And it's almost like two balls balancing on each other. And so the meniscus is even more important in giving you some congruity. The other thing is lateral meniscus is a lot more mobile and when you look at the load, the medial meniscus takes 50% of the load in the medial compartment but the lateral meniscus takes two-thirds of the load in the lateral compartment and that's why along with um, the shape of it, why having a lateral meniscectomy can be pretty devastating and lead to much more rapid progression of degenerate change. In the way that you can take someone's medial meniscus out a partial meniscectomy, and for 10, 15, 20 years, they may not get many, much significant degenerate change. Whereas um, these are um, some slides of Andy Williams's, and this is a patient who had a, a little lateral municipal tear that you see there that was just trimmed back, really quite minor. And kind of within three years, this guy um, was, sent, it was a, not professional, but he's pretty elite, but it's down to bone on bone. Um, and the <coughs> cartilage surfaces looked pretty good initially, and this was without any new injury. Um, and so Basically, this is why we want to preserve the meniscus wherever we can, and why understanding of the anatomy uh, is, is key. Um, the thing you're going to appreciate here is that there are a lot of circumferential fibres. And what the meniscus is, is viscoelastic, and as you get an axial force, it transmits it along the circumferential fibres and dissipates it through hoop stresses over a wider area. And then, so the predominant ones are the circumferential ones, and then you have lesser radial fibres. So the reason, if you have a tear such as a longitudinal tear, a bucket handle tear, that goes along the circumferential fibres. So that's got a much greater healing capacity, and that's why those are more likely, um, are better for repair. Whereas radial tears, you can't really repair those uh, very infrequently. And the other thing is that when we talk about a meniscus repair, the ultimate strength of a meniscus repair, and the greatest pull-out strength, is if you do a vertical one, either side to capture those circumferential fibres. And that's kind of and that's what you're going to practice in the lab because that shows why you want to capture those. This is a slide that everyone brings out. The reason I'm showing you this is because the blood supply, so this is a, a coronal view of a medial meniscus say of a left knee. And obviously lateral meniscus over here. And your blood supply comes from your medial and lateral um, geniculate arteries. And they form together to form this uh, perimeniscal uh, capsular plexus. And what that does is it, it supplies blood to the outer one third of the meniscus, roughly three millimeters. So if you've got something in those first three millimeters, that's got excellent healing capacity. And those are the things that will really heal well. If you go another th three millimeters or so, you go into the middle third, which is the red white zone, that has less healing capacity, but they're, still, they're things that I would certainly look to repair. Um, <coughs> And then the white white zone is an avascular that has very limited healing, and unless you're, uh, I would, most people would not would not repair those. 
like almost you know, 99% was considered not appropriate for repair. And this is just a top down view to give you an idea. So if you've got a longitudinal tear or periphery here, or a bucket handle, putting it back, there's a good chance that's got a chance of healing, because A, you're catching the circumferential fibres, um, and B, it's got a good blood supply, and that's what you need. And when we, there are adjuncts that I'll come back to where you can, if you're doing a repair, we take a diamond tip rasp, and what that does is it roughens up the periphery there to try and um, encourage healing and blood flow <coughs> and, into that. And you can do trephination, you take a needle and just puncture it, just to create some vascular access channels. So, you know, most people will try and repair an acute one. The fact is in the NHS we often see a lot of chronic ones. I have done quite a lot of um, delayed repairs, and I don't tend to have a timing on it, to be honest with you. Most people, the traditional teaching, I mean, the, the ma main indication was to do them within the first two months, but I think if you've got a repairable tear, almost at any time, I'd definitely give it a have a go at repairing it. So obviously these are the patterns, and just to go back, if you look at the top ones, they're all along the circumferential fibres, they're ones that have a, a capacity to heal. Um, obviously this one goes to the wire zone, so you'd probably just nip that there and take that bit away. But the fact is here, if you lose, if you take this away, you've got a very thin rim, and that patient's in trouble, that's someone who may go on to the meniscus transplant. Um, but doing a significant, and that's why I do see people in my clinic who've had a tear that's been a big bucket handle that was shaved away, and it, it could be that it wasn't repairable, and the ones that I have to take out sometimes, so it, sometimes it can be that the person doing it was, doesn't do repairs, um, but that will cause major problems, because the fact is it's proportional. The degree of meniscus that is removed, your contact pressures go up as your contact area um, is spread, and, the, and the, you will get arthritis, guaranteed. The fact is, a, a meniscectomy, uh, an average meniscectomy, will give you between a 50 and 70% increase in your contact pressures. Whereas the ones on the bottom, all ra the parrot beak, a radial tear, a flap tear, those you would not look to repair. And, and when we push the indications, these are the ones that I would consider repairing now. And I do repair these, but these are really challenging ones to repair, the, the classic radial tears, because they do go into that white, white zone. But we know that if you, if you lose that, then you've got significant instability there. Um, the fact is you've got a locked knee, I would always get an MRI scan because a lot of the time there is no lesion there necessarily, it can be a hamstring spasm. But if there's a bucket handle tear causing a lock, you want to get in early and repair it. If someone's got locking and giving way, these are your classical clinic patients. The fact is a lot of them don't get to theatre for 18 months. But the earlier you get in, the less chance of a chondral abrasion and quadriceps shutdown that you have. And obviously, we don't do it for pain and there's pretty clear evidence you don't. The only, it's very rare that I do an arthroscopy in anyone over the age of 50 to be honest with you unless someone's got really quite clear meniscal mechanical symptoms of locking or catching and if they've got good cartilage. But I've done, I've got a couple of guys um, who in, in their 50s, you know, one of them was a GBO 50 tri triathlete, but clear mechanical changes, uh, locking on a regular basis with grade two to three changes on his cartilage. And we had a whole chat about exacerbation of symptoms, so I think that should definitely come in any consenting for an arthroscopy. And he ended up getting massive increase in pain got rid of the locking, but his pain went up, we cons cons consented him for it. Had a long chat about it in advance, because I'm always nervous about it, he still wasn't happy. Um, he went on to have a uni eventually. And then obviously, if they're asymptomatic, I would just leave them alone. Um, I wouldn't touch those. <laughs> the aim obviously is to palliate the symptoms, get the function back, prevent the tear from propagating, that can be a good reason for repairing a longitudinal tear early. And obviously, you want to delay, as Sammy said, delay them getting to this stage. And all the things we talked about earlier, joint stability, congruency, articular pressure, lubrication, nutrition, all those things come into play as to why we would want to repair a meniscus. So there are a variety of factors that come into play. We've talked about where the tear is and the location already and the type of tear. And there's patient factors. Um, is it a patient who's going to be compliant with their repair? <coughs> Will they do their rehab? If you do a meniscus repair, are they? And I've done a couple I've regretted. You know, people who are never going, who don't are necessarily going to be compliant. You don't necessarily want to repair those. Then you've got more of a trouble having to go back in, perhaps, and take it out. Um, and if you're doing something else, it, then another procedure, uh, as you see here, an ACL reconstruction. The other ones you repair. The evidence is overwhelming. If you do a meniscus repair at the time of ACL reconstruction, the healing rates are in the 90s. Um, so this was the classical indications. It was a patient under the age of 40. I've done meniscus repairs in people in um, early 50s and had very good results. A recent tear, people say within two to three months. 
for me, if it's a repairable tear in a repairable zone, I, I've done one that's five years old and he's healed. Um, but then you really got to rasp it up, make vascular access channels and do that. The length of tear, possibly, longitudinal bucket handle do well. Red, 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 white zones we talked about. I said patient compliance. And all adolescents, wherever possible, because those kids are in trouble if you take the meniscus out early. Um, but they're the, they're the childish cases. Um, so wherever possible, try and repair the kids. And then these are the, the options that you have. When you're doing a meniscus repair, meniscus repair comes in three flavors, okay? Um, and it depends on where the tear is. So if we go to the maroon zone, so on this screen, I can see my colors don't match now, I feel quite embarrassed. But um, you can go all inside. All inside is your classical thing on a handle, fire, fire. That's an all inside suture. That works really well for the back. You can do the inside out where you go into the joint and the, and the suture comes out and you tie it on the outside. That's something that was the classical meniscal repair for all inside came. But it's, and I do them, uh, but they are technically challenging. They're much harder than the all inside. If you come into the body of the meniscus, you can go all inside, no problem. But you can get inside out uh, where you get that. And you can do an outside in where you pierce this way and pass your stitch. I'm going to show you what all these mean in a second because I appreciate these terms don't mean much. Uh, but if you're at the front, the only option in the front there is to do an outside in repair. And in the practical session now, we have all the kit to do all of these. <laughs> the fact is, if you haven't done a meniscus repair before, just do the oil inside, because that's all you're ever going to do. But if some of the guys who are a bit more senior who've done the oil inside, have a go at doing an, an inside out or an outside in. Every now and then, I don't need to, I don't need to, I do a fair bit of arthroscopy, but the fact is I probably do less than 10 outside ins a year. But it, and it's super easy when you know how to do it, but if you know how to do it, it's, so have a go at that as well. If, if, if you're starting off the first session, practice arthroscopy, triangulation, just probing all the different bits of the knee. I'd be happy if that's as far as it goes and uh, all inside the meniscus. But if you can do an outside in as well, the, I've got a video coming that makes it quite easy. So with the all inside, um, there is um, a bit like Hoover, a bit like um, you know, Coke. There is a generic brand that, um, made by a different company, um, the Fast Fix. This is the Arthrex's one now, which they've got here, which is called the, the Cinch 2. And the way it works is, basically, it, it, there's, you hold it in a handle, it's got an introducer, and what you do is, it comes, it's PDF, it's basically a preload, deploy, flip, PDF. So you start there, as you push it forward, that's really uh, preloaded, as you kick it forward to the front, it deploys, and then as you pull it all the way back again, it flips. And then you push this one to, to that first bump there, to pre-deploy it, uh, preload it, deploy it, and then flip it. I'll show you a video, which makes a lot more sense. And this is basically, um, so this is what I'm all inside. And if I was you, before you even go in the need to practice this, I'd do it on one of these. If you've not done it, just do it on this so you understand the steps. And that's absolutely fine. So whenever, before you do this, you would always rasp it with a diamond tip rasp. And you just run it along the tear uh, before you start this. You have a, a skid as an introducer to protect the cartilage. And then this comes in, and you can measure it, but the fact is, the preset length is probably enough. So it goes through, if you watch this, you see it comes through, and then you pull it back, it flips, and then you're going to push the second one up, so you, you get a bite there. As you put it through, the second one goes there, it's deployed there, and then you, and then you pull it back, and it flips. And this is uh, quite clever, because it's a bit like the other uh, the fast fix, it's a self-tying knot. So as you pull back on it, you take a, a, a knot pusher, and you push it down to tension the knot, and when you're happy with the tension, um, you just cut it. And you'd be surprised, most of the time, one or two sutures is, is pretty much all that you need. So that's the all inside. Does anyone have any questions about that? Anthony? How many steps should we have? That's a loaded question. 20 is <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Um, so there's no number. Uh, I, I, if it, uh, it's for me, if it's a, a, a teenager or a kid, I'd, I'd have two, three, four attempts. In an adult, I'd probably give it two. But there's no evidence for that. That's just, eventually you get an idea. At that point, you either go to an, an inside out, like this, or you don't. You can't do this, then you give it a <coughs> So just, just in terms of teenagers and kids, yeah. um, you have to be very careful for many reasons. So you don't go in the preset distance. Yes. Because the distance to the back of the shoes is much shorter. Yeah. And you tend to repair pretty much everything, yeah. even the white white zone, because the meniscus doesn't become its adult um, <coughs> blood supply pattern until about 12. So after the age of 12, actually most of all, it was very good. Yeah. Between 12 and 16, 
It's a, it's a watershed region. Yeah. So it's still at under 16. Because that birth of meniscus is fully vascularized, and bizarrely, it then recedes um, with age. Oh, I mean, can I just add in? I think I'll leave it. I mean, Cash, you're doing a great job, but you're, you're intentionally kind of slightly oversimplifying the kind of binary nature of, you know, repair versus resection. Yeah. Um, you know, the, I, I think that the, the preoperative kind of counselling bit of, of, this, of this process is extremely important. Yeah. Making sure that patients understand, you know, what is the chance of success given their MRI findings. And what are their functional requirements and what are their hopes and you know some of them kind of really do want just a quick fix and they understand that if they have a menisectomy there's an increased risk of arthritis and patient life but they don't want to spend a long period of rehab they just want to walk out of hospital and get on with whatever they were doing before um, whereas other patients you see who are really kind of psychologically zoned in on the idea of wanting to have a repair at all costs and you yeah. say well to be honest the configuration of your tear is, is not particularly amenable to a kind of I'm trying to give a pragmatic as to how to do the task here, and obviously that's important. <coughs> the facts, my, no, I'm pretty, my consenting is pretty robust. And the one thing I was doing in clinic and then in my letter is I always said I consent every single patient, no matter what, for uh, knee arthroscopy plus or minus meniscal repair or debridement. Yeah. Every single patient gets that. And the, as a registrar, the one thing that surprised me was that people turn up not knowing what they're having, and then they end up having a repair or a microfracture, and you're on crutch of six weeks. No, I can't. I've got to do the school run. So I say to patients <coughs> that I will assess the test if it's repairable or not. If I can repair it, then I'll do it. But then you're going to be partial weight bearing on crutches for six weeks. And if it's just a debridement, then you won't need a uh, brace and your crutches for a few days. And I, and I gave them, you'd be surprised, I've had two patients in my career who are both self-employed builders who wanted to take taken out no matter what. And everyone else, I generally tend to say, I do say it's a pain in the ass for six weeks because when you're on crutches, partial weight bearing, you can't even carry a cup of tea from one room to the next. And a lot of them say, most of them would say, but long term, I understand the benefits, so I'd rather have it repaired if I can. But you're right, the, the, that's all vital stuff, but I'm not covering that because we're no, just for no. a practical session. The next one is the inside out, and the inside out, is the classical um, historical meniscal repair that involves you basically passing needles into the knee and then outside and you tie the knot on the outside. The, the advantage of it is that you can pretty much repair almost anything with that. You can get to um, superior and inferior surfaces and you can do complex and it, it's cheap for what it's worth. Um, but the challenge with that is you've got to do posterior or postlateral uh, incision, and then you can put a retractor in because you can catch the neurovascular structures as you come out on either side. And the needles are massive. The needles are these huge long things, and I've given myself more than anything. The needle stick from these hurts like anything. Um, I've had a couple, and, uh, and so basically, um, but you pass multiple ones of these through, and what you do is you clip the needles in. You, ideally you want a, an assistant, and ideally you want to put the foot up at 90 degrees with, this, with a foot bar in advance. I don't use a foot bar <coughs> for my arthroscopy normally, but for this I do. Because otherwise you know it's a really inelegant thing where you're basically kneeling on the floor, they're just trying to pull the needles out, and they're jabbing them straight at your groin, um, which is not good, um, unless you're that inclined. And, um, and you can end up with lots of, and you can do lots and lots of sutures with that. But it's, it takes ages, a fast fix. A speed, a cinch two. A, <laughs> <laughs> there are other options. I've got to do this. I could just sense <laughs> Mike right there. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you, you can do it within, honestly, within 30 seconds. Whereas one of these things, this takes ages. To repair, for me to repair a bucket handle tear will take about 20 minutes, 30 minutes. To do this inside out will take me 45 minutes to an hour. Because you, there's so much collection you can do that you can The other thing is, these are all 2 O suture tape, 2 O Tychron. And you really want to get tight, and you've got to be careful because they snap all the time. It takes you spend ten minutes putting two of these in, and you get, and then you tie, and it just goes ping in your hand, and it's not there's not fun when it goes off in your hand. So this is um, just for its worth. They've got this thing called a zone navigator. There are lots of different ways of doing it. You need someone to introduce the needle, um, and basically the zone navigator that, we're, that you can look at here is a handle that makes it easier to orientate. And it's got these different angles to go to the front, the middle, of the, the back of the knee. And they come left or right, so you kind of just rotate them over. Um, sorry. And just the one thing I want to show you is, um, the, one thing about this, the one thing about this one, which makes it slightly easier than some of the other ones, is that you can, uh, there's, a, there's a thumb drive here. With this thumb thing here, you just feed it forward a centimetre of time. And you can actually come back, and actually the ability to come back is actually really quite handy. Uh, for these, 
Um, so you've got a bit of control. So if someone has, is comfortable with meniscal repair, you can have a go at doing this and that. Um, but the idea, and then, uh, and you can, obviously you can adjust your position like this. But this is the main thing. You can then see, you've got to have this incision down the side here, and you've got to have a retractor in there, and then someone's collecting all the needles to, to come out. So it's, it's a, it is hard work. And then the last one is the outside in meniscal repair, which is the one for repairing the anterior wall of the meniscus. Uh, Mike's gone so safe. Um, so basically, I tried to find it on, on Arthrex's website, it's a random document generator. And uh, basically, if you go on there, there's something about, something in 2015, there's something about PRP in the knee, there's something for 2015, 2015, 2014. And they, don't, they do have the outside in stuff, but they don't have it on the website. So, um, I made my own, so. <laughs> <laughs> Just don't really tell Mike. Um, so, they have their equipment here, you can practice it. But I'm going to show you the steps. So, you want to repair a tear in the anterior horn, and it's super easy. You get two parallel needles. You take a needle, poke it through. And then what you do is make a little incision next to it. Just so you can tie the suture, it's easier to do it here, and you've got a bit of wiggle room. Wiggle room. And you put the second one straight through there as well, and and then and this is actually really easy. But if you're doing it and you're not even practicing it, it, it looks hard. So just two of those. That's it. That's the stitch we want to repair, right? We're getting outside in. So then what happens is you put a, a, a loop through there, like that, and you just feed that thing through the loop. And then once you've got that, there, you just feel a mono, you feed a monofilament suture up through that. And the loop's going to grab that as you pull that back. And because you've already passed it through, there's no messing around trying to pass a grabber. And you just pull that out. And that's it. Usually one or two, one's enough in my experience, but you can do two. And then because you've got a little decision, you just tie it straight down. Now, the guys here, to be fair, I think their stuff looks pretty straightforward too. They've got, they've got a micro uh, suture lasso. And that works well too. Um, and then once you're doing the outside in, the other thing is, you can box to box it, you can do it with two spinal needles. If you get two spinal needles and a one PDS, you can, it, it's easier if you have like a loop retriever, but if you don't, you can still feed two loops through and pass another suture just using a, um, a spinal needle with a one PDS. Um, and then you can um, get this, get quite a few of them through and then tie it down. The last thing I'm going to just touch on, but um, it's just a meniscal root repair. The meniscal root repair is something that's only become relatively accepted and acknowledged in the last kind of couple of years. And, the, and if you look at the, the meniscus root, where it touches, the ACL is around here, that basically a tear within one centimetre of the posterior horn there is a meniscal root repair. And the, and the biomechanical studies show quite clearly that having a root repair is equivalent to having no meniscus. The pressure is just is crazy. And you can, the, the problem is you have to order the kit in advance, and I have just did one a few weeks ago. Um, and on one of the spine coordinators here. And basically, what you're gonna do, on the sagittal, what you see is what they call a ghost sign. You see a meniscus that you can't even quite see. You see a split on the axial, and then you see this clear separation on the on the um, coronal view. And the challenge is that unless you're looking for it, a radiologist probably won't mention it unless they're dedicated MSK radiologists. But this is a right knee medial meniscus left knee medial meniscus, and you can see it's completely come off there. It's lifted right off and it's loose as a goose. Um, I probably see this half a dozen times a year. And then this is what it looks like after a repair. Um, and so, I'll just show you the steps. I don't think anyone's going to practice this today. But they've now got low profile equipment, which is quite useful to use. Because I've done it with the ACL tibial guide, and it's quite pointy, and it can be a little bit tight to get it in at the back of the knee. But you can basically adjust where you're going to, where you're going to put this. This is the good thing about it. You can adjust which, which side you're going to drill from. And it's easy to come across from the other side of the tibia. So lateral for a medial meniscus and medial for a lateral. And then, this is the only time I use a flip cutter. Um, and what you do is you basically, you drill up to the back there, flip the, and then you can take this guide off and you've got a bit more. You have to whack, whack this in. Whacking that thing is the thing I forget so many times, then you're trying to find the bloody hole. Um, and you basically flip that, and you drill a little socket, and you take it back out a centimetre or so, come back up, unflip it, take it out. So that's where you're going to dock it in for the repair. And then what you're then going to do is you're then going to pass the suture through that. And that was something that was really quite difficult in the knee, but now um, there's a, a knee scorpion, and what you can do is you feed this link through like this, and it's actually really easy. Um, other companies make very equivalent things now for the knee. 
Traditionally, people would use shoulder ones, and it was a nightmare because it was enough space. And it's just a self tying luggage tab stitch. You tie it down, you've got a really good control of that, and you put a second one in. And then what you do is you pass a suture retriever up through there, pull it out, because all you want to do is you, it's just a means of shuttling these stitches with that down the tibial tunnel. And it's certainly an evolving process for me, because this is a technique I did. But then the other thing was I would just tie them over an endo button or just tie them on the tibia, but it was never quite tensioned enough. And I started using a suture ankle like you guys are using this morning, the swivel lock. And, and that makes um, quite a difference. The adjunct techniques I mentioned, abrasion with a diamond tip rasp, trephination by making <coughs> holes with a sharp thing. You can use a fibering clot, it's a very American thing to do. Prem, have you ever done it? Yep. Um, and, you, and, and I always <laughs> microfracture the notch at the end of a meniscus repair, just to release some of the mesocomal stem cells of bone, bone marrow. <coughs> and I won't talk about biologics. Um, meniscus repair is new. There's a thing called the ramp lesion. One thing, Sammy, um, in my diagnosis with knee arthroscopy, I always look for ramp lesions, um, which involves going between the medial femoral condyle and the footprint of the ACL. I would go to the back of the knee and always look for them, because it, um, people do miss them. They're pretty rare. It's funny, people present whole series of two, three hundred of them. I check every single patient and I probe it, and I think I've seen one in the last two years. A lot of it is what people call them, because they used to be called menisco capsule separation. Yeah. And I think that terminology is, 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 what, is what makes the ramp regions look new, but actually yeah. that's what they used to But the menisco capsule separation to me is something that's right on the edge of the meniscus. A fast fix would invariably, or a cinch too, would invariably get that. Whereas the ramp lesions are real because you can do a posture medial portal come from the back, it's quite challenging. White white tears, some people are repairing. And the horizontal cleavage tears are interesting because that's um, you end up with it, you've got this little bit that you debride, like that, you tear that out, and then you've got this split that's looking at you like a hamburger. And a lot of people traditionally will take one of those leaflets away completely because this will cause a parameniscal cyst. Um, and then um, so what I do for these is I then I do repair these. So that's a diamond tip rasp, just rasping it up, and then a repair going in, and just usually one is enough just to close that mouth off, just to prevent a cyst coming back, and it gives you stability and prevents any propagation. Um, yeah. And then microfracture the notch, just with a chondral pick. Um, the last thing is mentioned is Pete um, Bates has started doing a podcast, so I don't know if you guys know about it, but it's, have a listen. Cool, thank you very much.